everybody. We hand these out for a reason. And somebody stand and read what's on the front cover. Somebody, right quick. We ain't got all day. You'll be fussing that I kept you too long. Methodists will beat us to lunch. Okay, Connie volunteered. Go ahead, Connie. Amen. You agree with that? Of course you do. You like that. That's a powerful verse of Scripture. I'm glad that Dana uh, puts thought into doing the bulletin to be an encouragement to, to each of us. If you will look inside, there is a mention uh, that uh, David and Mary Ann, they're getting married on the 17th, 7 o'clock here at the church, and uh, you're invited, and they want you to attend. It's a celebration to... to uh, to celebrate their wedding, so put that on your calendar and come out and support your brother and sister and and their uh, their new life together. Good to see each one of you this morning. Good to have guests with us this morning, John Henry. Good to see you this morning. Good to have uh, all of you here. Uh, David had mentioned that uh, I requested that song. We've got a video that we're going to show and that I want to show in just a minute. And I wanted to introduce it, though, because you're going to wonder, okay, how does this apply to what we're doing today in the book of Romans? And uh, the tallies were out last week, and so David was teaching this morning, and he made mention of something. I said, well, if you'd have been here last week, I had an example for that, and talked to him about it in a minute. He said, I thought you covered that like four weeks ago, so... (laughs) It just kind of all keeps rolling along together, you know, so that's what we'll continue to do today. But no rehearsal today. Don't jump in and go with it. As we are coming down to the end of Romans, though, and and I told you last week that last verse of the message last week was actually the end of Romans proper, we'd call it, because now it's going to just be personal. He's just on talk to them about his trip back to Jerusalem and coming to see them, and he's thanking a bunch of people. And I've read through this. uh, I've preached through it. I've read through it. But there was, you won't get this in the King James and the New King James, and neither one. The jewel that jumped out at me this week, there is a jewel hidden right in this remark. And, you know, I've told you, I've tried to get in the, the the mind of Paul as he's writing this, I promise you he chose it for a reason, or I think I can promise you that, knowing Paul. And so we don't have a video introducing this, and then you still don't think, what's that got to do with anything? But as we look at Romans uh, 15 in just a moment, I hope it will become clear.
the day of atonement was for the children of, of Israel. That's what Leviticus tells us. Look with me in uh, Romans chapter 15. It'll be on the screen, but Romans 15 verse 14. Now we cut into the middle of this chapter when he's dealing with uh, all of chapters uh, 12, 13, 12 through 16 is dealing with how we as believers should be treating one another, the importance of the church and spiritual gifts and, and all of that. And we just ended up talking about uh, how the those that are more mature should bear with those that are uh, weak in the faith, less mature in the faith. And so he comes to verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, also able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. Now that's, that's an important sentence there for us to remember that uh, he's writing to the Roman people because God called him to, God gave him the grace to do this, and I've, I've written pretty boldly to you on some points, uh, but it's because of the grace of God given to me, I'm speaking for God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So you see the Gentiles mentioned uh, twice in this passage as opposed to the Jews. Moses was to the Jews. The law was to the Jews. Jesus' early ministry was only to the house of Israel. It was to the, to the Jews. Paul was to the Gentiles. That's the difference. That's not new information to you. you uh, we've covered all of that. But let's look at verse 16 again. Because here's where you miss the jewel. Because I'm reading out of the New King James. And I read out of the King James, and here's what both of them say, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That just sounds like so many of his other statements that he's made about being a minister. Ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Last week, you look back up just four or five verses, you'll see the wording where Jesus Christ is the servant uh, to, to the Jews or to the circumcised, right? You see that? I forget what verse it was, but that's just a few verses uh, above where we're reading uh, this morning. Is the sound working? Okay, in verse six, 16. So we're a couple of verses back. Jesus, uh, the Paul said that Jesus was a servant to the circumcised. And I made mention of it. The word servant can be translated minister. Many of different translations translate servant and minister are usually just, uh, um, can be either one, kind of context. But also the word deacon, because the actual Greek word is diakonos, and so deacon is a transliterated, you hear the sound, diakonos uh, and deacon, and so that's the same word Paul used when he was talking to deacons, talking about deacons. So we find that, uh, that uh, the word minister can be translated, or the word diakonos can be translated servant, minister, deacon. Paul opens his letter up to the Rome, to the Romans, with the word bondservant. 
In some translations, it's slave. He says, uh, uh, I, Paul, a doulos, that's the Greek word, a bondservant, a slave of Jesus Christ. So Paul had at his disposal two greatly, widely used words, diakonos and doulos, to both talk, to, to talk about being a servant. But he didn't use either one of them here. In fact, this statement here in verse 16 is only used here in the entire New Testament. And that's what excited me when I saw that something's going on here. This is the only place in the New Testament he referred to himself as a minister with the word that we would, it sounds more like our word for lit, uh, liturgy, the liturgy of, of worship, the, uh, the, the routine of worship. And then the, the next phrase that he uses, that of ministering the gospel, is actually that of the priesthood. And so next verse. Here it is, that, no, back up, I didn't read that one. Here it is in the English Standard Version. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. You see the difference? It's not using that word minister. We get, we get comfortable with that word. He used it all through the New Testament. That's not the word he picked out here. He reached over and picked out a word that he had not used in the entire New Testament when he said that he was called. That's why verse 15 so important. God called me to write to you. He gave me the grace to do it so that I might be a, in a sense, all of this is one, one phrase. To be a priestly minister is actually the sense of what Paul is saying. A priestly minister of the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's in the New King James. The, the ESV is that of the priestly service of the gospel of God. Now look at what. This is a new translation for me. It's called God's Word, God's Word translation. But it says, to be a servant of Christ Jesus, same verse, 16, to the people who are not Jewish. So our modern versions have, you know, trying to make it where we understand it a little better. It doesn't mention Gentiles, but um, to the people who are not Jewish. That's everybody, all the Gentiles was everybody but a Jew. And he says, and I serve as a priest by spreading the good news of God. I do this in order that I might bring the nations. I like that translation. That goes along with my, my, uh, my uh, whatever you want to call it, my bandwagon I'm on about racism. The, the, the scriptures never call peoples of God different races. It calls us different nations. It calls us different peoples, but not different races. And so I do this, Paul says, I'm writing this in order that I might bring the nations of God. And does it say I might bring the nations of God, I might bring their, their, their offering to God? You look at that real close. Is he saying I'm... I'm headed over somewhere and I'm going to bring an offering because he's about to say that, but he's not saying it here. He's not talking about the nations, the Gentiles' money. He's not talking about their sacrifices, their, their, their good works. He's talking about them. Next verse. In the NIV, he says, and called by God, to verse 15, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become a 
an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That is good. So now you see where the video comes in. Only once a year would the high priest, and he'd have to bathe himself, He'd have to put on the linen garments that had never been worn. And he'd have to come into the, to the, to the brazen altar and sacrifice a bullock for his own sin, that of his household, his family. And then with the, the sacrificing of one of the kid goats, he would approach the, the holy place and pass by the laver, which is like a lavatory. It's a basin. It holds water. And he would wash his hands off, symbolically cleansing of sin. And he would enter into the holy place. He would pass by on the one side, on the right side, the showbread. Jesus is the bread of life. He would pass by on the left side, the menorah. The lampstand, Jesus is the light of the world. And he'd get up to the altar of incense and he'd be carrying that fire from the brazen altar and he'd take that incense then and, and, and pull back the veil, which the veil is the picture of the, of the incarnation of Christ, the, the flesh of Christ, the body of Christ. That's why at Christ's death, the veil rent from top to bottom. Either God did it or he sent an angel to do it, or, but the veil rent. That, not that Christ's body was broken. We know particularly he, not a bone was broken, but uh, a euphemism or just the way we use language is, he died. His body was broken in the fact that it, he died. He died on the cross. And so that, that uh, high priest going behind that veil with that incense, that cloud that's going up to, toward heaven, an acceptable sweet aroma that he accepts. And then the, the blood placed sprinkled out on, the, out on the mercy seat. That happened once a year. That was given to Moses to give to the children of Israel. There was a court outside later added for the Gentiles, but no Gentile could ever come into the, uh, into the courtyard, into the uh, holy, certainly not in the holy place, and so most definitely not in the holy of holies. But the Israelites were to take the message of God to the nations, but of course they didn't. But here's what I'm thinking was in the mind of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul has, because he's a, uh, a Benjaminite, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He could have been the high priest of Israel. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but he was a very trained man. Philippians, he says, you want to talk about the Hebrews? Man, I've circumcised the eighth day, the feet of Gamaliel. I've, I've done all that stuff of the tribe of Benjamin. And he walks in, mentally speaking, spiritually speaking. He has come into the brazen altar. And he has witnessed the real sacrifice, the true sacrifice being that of Jesus Christ. And he comes in through the holy place, through the veil that has been rent, through the death of Jesus Christ and the showbread and the incense or the, the uh, lampstand and the incense. And church, he's standing at the mercy seat Offering up the Gentile nations, which is us. And what God sees is nothing but the blood. 
and we stand there as an offering to God that God accepts when he sees the blood. And that's how Paul is presenting this last little, you just think, closing statements, and he throws this jewel out of how he wants the Roman people to know who they are. I don't build you up just to pat you on the back, and Paul didn't either. But church, we are different to the rest of the world. We are special to God because of what Christ did, and by our faith in what Christ did, And I've said it and said it and said it. No wonder on the one hand there's the wrath of God poured out on an unbelieving world because they won't accept this. And no wonder we have the grace of God to the glory of God on the other side because we have by faith nothing but our grace or the grace given us by God and our faith in what Christ did on the cross. He offers us up now as an offering, sweet-smelling incense, our prayers unto, unto God that he finds acceptable. I like that. That's a jewel right there that, like I said, you didn't get in just reading those two words in, in the English, uh, in the King James or New King James, but it is there, as you saw it in these other translations, as a priest offering up, the Gentiles. That's what he was called to do. The Damascus Road experience was about him being sent to the Gentile, to the nations. And that's why I started with the title, A Missionary Heart. This man had a missionary heart. This man knew what it was like to tell people about Jesus Christ. And that's why we backtrack all the way to chapter 1 when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You can understand that now. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is, it, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There it is. Now I'm just going to read the rest of it. You basically got the message. The rest of it's just interesting, I think. But I'm going to reread the first three verses. And I'm reading it now in the message. And the message is a translation. It's not just a paraphrase. But, man, it's in modern vernacular. So I want you to hear it this morning as he's just writing to us, writing to the Roman church. Personally, he says, I've been completely satisfied with you, with, with who you are and what you are doing. You seem to me to be well motivated and well instructed, quite capable of guiding and advising one another. Uh, Paul's writing to the church at Rome of which he never visited. But as you can see in these last remarks, he was excited for them and about going to see them. He, he, he's concluding with, with an excitement that he, he's proud of what he's heard about this church and he can't wait to get there. Verse 15, so my dear friends, don't take my rather bold and blunt language is criticism. It's not criticism. I'm simply underlining how very much I need your help in carrying out this highly focused assignment God gave me. This priestly and gospel work of serving and the spiritual needs of the non-Jewish outsiders so they can be presented as an acceptable offering to God made whole and holy by God's Holy Spirit. Looking back over what has been accomplished and what I have observed, I must say I am most pleased. In the context of Jesus, he's saying, he said, I'm not patting you know, myself on the back or you necessarily, but in the context of, of worshiping Jesus, I even say proud, but only in that context. I have no interest in giving you a chatty account of my adventures, only the wondrously powerful and transformingly present words and deeds of Christ in me that triggered a believing response among the outsiders. In other words, he's saying, I've, 
I've, I've had some success, but it's been because of Jesus. Verse 19, in such ways I have trailblazed a preaching of the message of Jesus all the way from Jerusalem far into northwestern Greece. Some 1,400 miles, if you look on the map, he either walked or he, rode a, he was in a boat. Uh, 1,400 miles, he says, I've, I've trailblazed the gospel. And my text has been, those who were never told of him, they'll see him because I'm going to show them. That's what he's saying, because I'm going to tell them. Those who've never heard of him, they'll get the message. That's a quote out of the Old Testament. In your Bible, it's set apart probably as a, you can see it as a quote. But it's interesting what Paul was saying. He, he's, he's saying, I, I was not interested in going to all these places where uh, other people had already been. I'm, I, I was called to be a trailblazer. I went where nobody else had been. That's kind of a Star Trek thing, isn't it? I'm not sure. But anyway, carry on. Verse 21. My text has been, those who were never told of him, they'll see him. And those who've never heard of him, they'll get the message. And that's why it has taken me so long to finally get around to coming to you. But now that there is no more pioneering work to be done in these parts, and since I have looked forward to seeing you for many years, I'm planning my visit. I'm headed for Spain and expect to stop off, in, off on the way to enjoy a good visit with you. And eventually, have you send me off with God's blessing. First, though, I'm going to Jerusalem to deliver a relief offering to the followers of Jesus there, the Greeks all the way from the Macedonians in the north to the Achaeans in the south decided they wanted to take up a collection for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. In 2 Corinthians, he documents that very carefully. About, about two chapters he deals with what it means to, to give to the poor and so forth. And I want you to notice something, just, just a little, what, six words here thrown in here. They were happy to do this, but it was also their duty. Christian, that's to us. They were happy to do this. They were happy to help the poor of Jerusalem, but it was also their duty, seeing that they got in on all the spiritual gifts that flowed out of the Jerusalem community so generously, it is only right that they do what they can to relieve their poverty. Boy, you talk about a reason to give because of what you've been given. As soon as I have done this, personally handed over this, I like this fruit basket, the fruit that they were offering, I'm off to Spain with a stopover with you in Rome. My hope is that my visit with you is going to be one of Christ's most extravagant blessings. He was looking forward to going to Rome. He did make it, but it was certainly not on his terms, was it? You think, you, you think your prayers don't get answered or, or your idea of your life goes awry? <laughs> Man, here's the greatest man since Christ and it didn't go like he was thinking he was excited he I'm coming to you I I think it's going to be great I have one request well he's a preacher he ended up giving them two <laughs> I have one request dear friends pray for me pray strenuously with and for me to God the Father through the power of our master Jesus through the love of the Spirit, that I will be delivered from the lion's den of unbelievers in Judea. And if you remember reading some in Acts, and I think mainly in Acts, where so many just said, Paul, don't go back. They're waiting on you. It's not don't go good, Paul. Don't don't go. They're, they're after you. They're laying in wait for you. And he said, well, I've got to go. And he goes back to Jerusalem, and this is his last time to go to Jerusalem. He carries them this great gift from the Macedonians, and, and, uh, and the lions are there. Uh, that I will be delivered from the lion's den of unbelievers in Judea, Jewish people. And here's his second prayer. Pray also that 
my relief offering to the Jerusalem believers will be accepted in the spirit in which it is given. You know, Gentiles given to the Jews, and may they take it as an, an humble offering in the name of Christ, not, not because they think they're better than us or whatever. May they just accept this offering. Then, verse 32, then, God willing, I'll be on my way to you with a light and eager heart, looking forward to being refreshed by your company. God's peace be with you all. And in our Bibles it says amen, but I like this. Oh, yes, as he concludes that chapter. Well, it didn't go like he thought. By the time he got through Festus and Felix and King Agrippa, they had done wrong him, sent him through the lion's den, so to speak, but he had witnessed for Jesus all the way through, and finally he, he appealed to Caesar. In fact, Felix ended up saying, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, I think we should just let him go because it seems odd to me. That's pretty much the way... Uh, the message probably put it somewhat like this. Felix said, it just kind of seems odd to me that we're sending a prisoner to Caesar and we don't even have a charge. Hey, that's kind of familiar today, isn't it? But uh, that kind of happens uh, maybe all the way through time. But it happened with, with uh, Paul. He ended up in, in Rome. In the book of Philippians, he ends up writing to the Philippian church saying, those of the household of Caesar greet ye. So what was he doing while he was chained up in the household of Caesar, witnessing to all the servants and to all the jailers and everybody that would come by him, everybody that would listen, he was telling them about Jesus. I kind of like studying about old Apostle Paul. Um, Kelly has commented that I comment a lot about David Dixon. David Dixon truly just reminds me of the Apostle Paul. Statue, personality, all that he's suffered and done. And, of course, he would run the other way if he heard this. But uh, he has done a lot for, for Christ and the, and the people of Latin America and so forth. But uh, church... We are blessed. We are an offering that God has accepted, that God smiles over. And it's not because we're Baptist, we're better than anybody else. We know that. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away all our sin. And when we stand there as an offering unto God, and I wonder if God just, like the the whole parable of the prodigal son, the father just looking down the road for the son, him even running out to greet the son, arms wide open, bring the ring and, and the coat and kill the fatted calf because God's not just smiling when he sees us come into his presence and when we bring someone else into his presence as the story of the prodigal son before that was looking for the sheep and the joy that's found when a sheep is found, when the coin is found. Boy, that segues right into Wednesday night visitation, doesn't it, Miss Margie? It's, it's going to be a, a, a joyous occasion in heaven when we lead someone to the Lord and we bring them as an offering, just like Paul. So in that sense, we know the Scriptures teaches we are all priests. As Christians, we are priests. And as we uh, witness someone to Christ, we are offering that person up to God as a sweet-smelling offering uh, through the name of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads.